Hi, this is Sarit Schwetzer, and welcome to the It Is Taught podcast, a podcast devoted to the teachings of Rabbi Schneir Zalman of Liadi, as recorded in his most famous work, the Tanya. My hope for this show is to make these teachings accessible and relatable to the average person, regardless of prior Jewish education or affiliation. The episodes follow the prescribed daily study portions and are meant to serve as practical lessons in how to live your life as your true self and develop an authentic and powerful relationship with your Creator. I have personally experienced the effects the study of this work has had on me, and I'm excited to share what I can of this knowledge with you. So please join me on this journey of learning, self-growth, and connection with your Source. Hi, and welcome to the It Is Top podcast. This is episode 190 for the first of Sivan in a leap year. So it's Rosh Chodesh today, so happy Rosh Chodesh. And so for today's Tanya, before we begin, <clears throat> I actually want to give you guys a little bit of an insight into my process in terms of putting together this podcast and the difficulty that I had today. So the section for today is really sm- really short and deceptively simple on first glance. And like when I first looked it over, like what I usually do in preparation for the podcast is I I look over the section that we're going to be going over today and I, you know, try to understand it on a basic level. And then I try to think of things of some example or story or something that we can relate to in our regular, in our daily regular life that will help to really grasp both for me and for the listeners, what's really going on and, and to try to internalize this idea. And so the more I started to really think about the Tanya for today, the more difficulty I had in doing this and the more abstract it really came to seem. And I started to realize that sometimes these teachings of Tanya, like sometimes I'll I'll look at a section that's actually really long and it can feel really overwhelming at first, but then I'll read it and it's, I don't want to say it's like easy to understand, you know, and I'm sure there's always more levels of understanding, but it's easier for me, at least on some level, to relate to, and I can immediately find applications and relevancy to my life. Other times, like today, it's a lot harder to do that, and I start to realize just how, it gives me a sense of just how deep the Tanya is and how many layers of unfolding there are, and also how in learning Chassidus, especially if you've been learning Chassidus for years, which I have at this point, then a lot of terms are kind of like thrown around a lot that we hear a lot, like Shrina, Tsum Atsilas, you know, like these kind of things. And we kind of have this like very maybe fuzzy map in our head of where all these terms are. We throw them around and we kind of in throwing the terms around, we we feel like we understand what we're saying. But in preparing for this podcast, what it really forces me to do, and this is one of the reasons why I decided to start this podcast is really for my own selfish understanding of the Tanya. It really makes me confront just how little I do understand of these things sometimes and how, yeah, like mind boggling these concepts are and how they're, they're not, there's more to me than meets the eye with them. And they really require a lot of thought and contemplation to even get a glimpse of like what's actually going on. So with that being said, so that's not so much of a disclaimer. So as just kind of like maybe like a preparatory note uh, in the Tanya today for me telling you guys that I'm learning this together with you. (laughs) And I'd love to hear your thoughts on the Tanya today or anytime and see if maybe you can think of really more practical applications or, uh, or how you came to understand this on a deeper level. And sometimes, which I feel like is sort of my takeaway from today's Tanya, is that sometimes we have to kind of just accept that we don't fully understand. So, and we can accept that we can like form a map in our minds of what the altar is talking about. And we can kind of say, okay, so this is happening and this is happening and this is happening. I don't really get it. And, and we kind of have to be okay with that because we have to kind of grapple with the idea that the human intellect is by nature limited and that kind of. In a sense, that's almost the whole purpose of learning Chassidus is this paradox of that we learn and learn and learn and try to understand God to the best of our ability, only to come to realize that it's actually impossible for us to understand God. So with that being said, so let's get straight into it and learn as we go. 
So for context, we are still in the middle of chapter 52 of Likutei Amarim, and we've been discussing the whole idea, like the bigger discussion that we've had in this chapter and in the previous chapter as well, is this question about God and about God's presence in the world. And this seeming paradox of, on the one hand, we say that God is everywhere and in everything, and there is no place devoid of him. Nothing can exist other than him. But then on the other hand, we clearly say that there are certain places that are holier than others. There are certain actions that we do that are holier than others. There are there's a Torah, there's mitzvahs. So why? Like, what's the point of it all? If just everything is holy, if everything is godliness, there's nothing other than God. And so that led us into a whole discussion about the idea of the Shekhinah and about the idea. And we gave the analogy of the human and the human soul and how it is that, well, this at the same time, when we look at a human soul, for example, then the human soul is present throughout the entire body equally. Nevertheless, and it's true, the human soul is found in the foot just as much as it is in the stomach, just as much as it is in the heart. It's everywhere. It's that we can't say that the soul is in one place and not in another place. We can also say that the soul is also equally hidden throughout the body, that there's the true soul, the true essence of the soul is, is not really revealed in any place in the body at all. However, we did talk, then that led us into a discussion about the brain. And we talked about how there is something unique about the brain. And we talked about the idea of how what is unique about the brain in terms of its relationship with the soul is that the soul, in order to connect with the body, it influences, it sends a certain influence, like it sort of sheds a certain light, like a, like we gave the analogy of like the sun, when the sun sends out rays of sunlight into the world. And that this, like the hub through which these rays of influence are sent out, just like maybe in terms of the sun, we can think of maybe like a light bulb, which is like sort of containing a certain amount of light. Then that hub in the human body is the brain. So while the brain doesn't contain more of the soul than any other part of the body, it does have a certain more of a revelation of the soul's light within it. And that revelation of the soul's light from the brain manifests, this is from where this, the radiance of the entire, the influence of the entire soul goes out, permeates throughout the entire body. It, it travels through the brain. So the way that this translates in terms of God and God's presence in the world is that God too, while he's equally present throughout the entire world equally, he's also equally hidden from the entire world equally. Nevertheless, just like in terms of the soul, God also has this like radiance that he sends out into the world. And there's a hub, there's a hub of this influence, this radiance. And for God, that's called the Shechina. So the Shechina is the nerve center, so to speak, through which the entire world receives its vitality. And then the way, where we left off yesterday is we talked about how this influence from the Shekhinah cannot be experienced directly. Because it, if we were to experience this influence in a more direct way, we would nullify out of existence. We would lose our existence. Similarly to the fact that like we can't look at the sun directly or like we can't experience a ray of sunlight within the sun itself. Because if we were to shine a ray of sunlight within the sun itself, then that sunlight would cease to exist. It wouldn't have an independent existence anymore. Like you can't, if you go into the sun, you can't like point out all the different rays of sunlight. They all just revert back to their source, which is the sun itself. So we left off, that's where we left off last time. We left off with this idea of like understanding, like basically stating this idea of, uh, of how the entire vitality of the world comes through the Shechina, just like the entire vitality of our soul comes through our, our brains, is transmitted through the brains. But then we also left off with the idea of like, okay, but we need some kind of filter. We can't experience the radiance of the Shechina in a direct way, because if we would, then we would not have any type of existence of our own. The way that I understand this in terms of the soul, and this is just my own kind of like deduction from this, even though the ultra rabbit doesn't mention this, is that similarly, when it comes to the brain influencing the body, it's like we, 
when we have the brain and we have the body, there needs to be another step in order to have the brain influence the body. We can't just like have a brain and then the, there's like a lot going on inside that brain, things we don't even understand, things we don't even know about. And it's such an intense place that in order for the brain to actually influence the body and to actually have the body do any particular thing or feel any particular thing, there needs to be some kind of filter. There needs to be some kind of garment, which is what the altar bay calls it. So today we're going to learn about what that garment is in terms of God. So, uh, and, and in terms of the Shekhinah and what, what that garment is. So the altar bay begins here. So now we're getting into the text. So the altar bay says, what type of garment could hide this and, and enclose the Shekhinah so that it won't become nullified in its light? So what is it? So the, the garment is the will and wisdom of God. As they are enclosed in Torah and mitzvahs that are revealed to us and to our children. Because we know that the Torah emerges out from Hashem's Chochmah, from Hashem's wisdom. And this Chochmah comes from the supernal world, which is high, 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 way above the Alma Desgalia. Alma Desgalia is the revealed world, which if you remember, if you're taking notes from a few episodes ago, that's another term for the Shekhinah. As we say, which translates to mean he is the wise one, but without a wisdom that is knowable. So let's just take a pause here and, and try to understand that for a second. So basically what the Altar Rabbah is saying is that we have a problem here because the Shekhinah is too much. It's too overwhelming. It's like the sun. So if we want the Shekhinah to influence the world and send radiance into the world, it needs some kind of garment. It needs some kind of filter. And so what is the garment? What is the filter by which the Shekhinah can come into this world and, and, uh, and fill up the entire world? This is the garment of Hashem's Torah and mitzvahs through which he enclosed his will and wisdom. And the altar of says that the way that this happens and the, the reason why this will and wisdom as manifests through the Torah and is able to serve as this proper garment is because it comes from such a high place, is because it comes from actually a much higher place than the Shekhinah itself. So while the Shekhinah comes from this world called Alma Desgalia, or it's also called, it's synonymous with the word, with the world of Alma Desgalia, the revealed world, God's Torah and wisdom comes from a very supernal world, a world that's much, much higher, a place of Chochmah, which is actually unified with God himself. So, so I'm going to just insert my own thoughts here. This is not what's written in the Tanya itself, but this is just the way that I understand this in terms of going back to that analogy of the soul and the body, which I think is a way to make this a little bit more personal, a little bit more understandable, is again, so we, we think about the brain. So it's interesting, even in psychology, there's this idea of consciousness. So there's, there's this idea of a realization that there's a difference between the brain and the mind. They're not synonymous. There's, they're, they're somewhat different. So I remember learning about this at McGill, like just the whole, there's a whole study in psychology of consciousness. What is consciousness? What makes consciousness? And so just in terms of my understanding here and how I'm relating it to this, how do we get the brain to actually influence the body? How do we get this like really obscure substance, like this like gooey gray matter to actually have an effect on the body? We need something higher than the brain to do that. What is higher than the brain? Higher than the brain is consciousness. Consciousness is not in the brains. Consciousness is something outside and above the brain. And the consciousness is our will and wisdom. Just like God, Lahavdil, so to speak, has his own will and wisdom, we have will and wisdom. And this consciousness is the missing ingredient that allows us to actually come and have our brain and dictate to our brain what it needs to do. And, and it gives our brain something to be vested within in order for it then to affect the body and to be present in the body. And so now let's get back to the text. So the altar over here is really emphasizing the point that the light of the Ein Sof Baruch Hu is vested and unified with this supernal wisdom. And he and his wisdom are one and the same. So now there's an implied question here, which is that if we were saying this whole time that the Shechina is so lofty, it's so great, it's so, it's like the sun, you know, and then it's like, everything, if we experienced it directly, then the sun would, then everything would expire within its source and we wouldn't be able to have our own existence. So then the obvious question comes up is that, okay, so now we're saying like, okay, but then, so the Shekhinah becomes vested within God's will and wisdom, which is the Torah, but this 
God's will and wisdom comes from a higher place than the Shekhinah. So how would that solve the problem? How would we not then still be nullified in our source, right? And so the answer to that is that Altrover says that this God's will, will and wisdom, it descended by way of different levels that, that obscure it from level to level in this whole hishtalshlos of the worlds, like this chain reaction with the descent of the worlds until it became vested in physical things, which are the 613 mitzvahs of the Torah. So this, again, this goes back to, and this is this is where the section ends today. So this goes back to this idea of symptom. And I think symptom is really that such a, it's such an obscure, like we do, it's so essential in chassidus and it's something we talk about a lot, but it's so obscure and it's really, I don't think it's something that we can truly, truly understand and truly grasp, honestly. It's like we can learn about it, we can talk about it, we can detail it in a certain way, but ultimately it's 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 very, at least for me, is like um, beyond my grasp because it's, we're saying basically that there's this, there's God who is everything and everywhere and there's nothing devoid of him but somehow he did this miraculous thing where he concealed himself and so this miraculous thing this symptom that happens that went and in here we're talking about it in terms of the chain of events by which he took his will and wisdom and he progressively hid it from the world through each level one by one by one that's what made it palatable to us that's what allowed this torah this his will and wisdom to become an apt garment for the shrina so in sum just to kind of bring this all together so again so it's like we are trying to talk about how it is that god's vitality is here in the world and we learned that the vitality god's vitality here in the world it goes through a channel which is known as the shrina the d divine indwelling and that shrina is the beginning of this revelation of God here in the world, of God's vitality. However, the Shekhinah is very bright. It's very like intense. And in order for us to, for this to happen, for us to experience this Shekhinah and receive this vitality, it needs filters. It needs garments that it will pass through. And what are the garments? The garments are God's will and wisdom, which come from a higher source than the Shekhinah itself. So thus, it's able to assist the Shrina because it does come from a higher place and vested within and is manifest within the Torah and mitzvahs that we know. And then the reason why that this, these Torah and mitzvahs are able to serve as garments for the Shrina and not just have the same issue of like just being too lofty and that we would expire within them is because this will and wisdom as it's enclosed within the Torah and mitzvahs came down or comes down, I should say, through a chain reaction of concealment and samsum through a whole chain of descent until it comes and becomes manifest in our world. So that is it for today. I hope that was somewhat comprehensible. Again, I know it is really uh, a lot and kind of abstract, but we're going to try to learn this together to the best of our abilities and we'll continue along these lines tomorrow and I will speak to you then. Thanks for listening to the It Is Top podcast, hosted by Sarit Switzer. This podcast is dedicated in loving memory of my maternal grandfather, Abraham Yitzhak ben Binyamin Cohen of Blessed Memory. Music by Shoshana. If you enjoyed this episode and would like to support the show, please share it with others and subscribe on YouTube, Apple iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And make sure to leave us a five-star review. To find out more about the It Is Taught project, including more information on my soon-to-be-published book, please visit our website, itistaught.com. To catch the latest from me, follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Looking forward to speaking with you tomorrow, and until then, have a great day.